So good evening, everyone. Um, and thanks very much for joining us for the restart of our community lecture series. Hopefully some of you at least were here for our lecture in February focusing on vaccines. That was kind of our kickoff um, event, but we actually are restarting with our science panelists. We're gonna have two great speakers tonight that are joining us. I'm gonna kick it off as usual. I'm Eileen Anderson, professor and director of the UCI uh, Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center. I'm really pleased to see so many participants logging on. I know it's challenging right now, so many things going on in all of our lives. So thanks for joining us. As most of you know, if you've been with us over the last couple of years, we are a center at uh, UCI that focuses on stem cell research. We have over 50 faculty across six schools, 21 departments. And our mission really is spanning the spectrum of what you do in science from discovery research through teaching and on into healing um, because of our focus on translational research and the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Initiative. I wanna start out with just a couple of quick thank yous. Of course, as usual, Brian Cummings, our Stem Cell Research Center uh, Community Outreach Chair, Judy Beck, who runs our communications, and Will Alvarez and Kyle Good, who's joining us tonight from UCI Media, without whom none of these things um, would be possible. And just as importantly, a thank you to everyone else who's joining us tonight. Um, certainly you've heard me share over the last two seasons of this, that a really critical thing we were concerned about was funding for Prop 14 and the relaunch of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Whether you just attended one of these and got some information, whether you actually voted, whether you talked to a neighbor about the sorts of things that happen with stem cell research and the kinds of things that we do to this um, within the center, I just wanna take a moment and really um, appreciate your participation and thank you for whatever it is that you might've done, because this is an incredibly exciting time for us. 2021 is going to relaunch CIRM and just a few of those initiatives that are gonna be critical include training internships for undergraduate students, fellowships for graduates, postdocs um, and uh, post MD students, in fact, residents, funding for shared resource uh, laboratories, including techniques training and cores. These are restarts of initiatives that we have been scrabbling to get by without funding, refunding for our alpha stem cell clinics, which we'll be hearing more about in a couple of weeks, along with this translational grant funding pipeline from discovery through translation grants on up into clinical grants, which is really the goal of everything that we do to engage in basic research and move it through the translational pipeline. You may ask, how can I help? Well, there's not a lot that uh, many people can do in person right now, but you can participate still. Um, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Facebook, visit our website, which is up here on the screen. Make a gift, you can contact Amber Harness, who works with us at UCI. And again, philanthropic support is so important for what we do. It is an engine that drives discovery at the level of seed funding, which is something that is very important to us. I'll be reaching out over the next couple of weeks as we go on and do these lectures, couple of months, I should say, and talking about some vignettes along that CIRM funding pipeline and how it's impacted us and how our philanthropic donors um, have helped us to achieve those goals where we're going from here as a center. That said, I wanted to just take a couple of minutes and, and kind of introduce um, my thoughts coming into restarting this community lecture series. I was really passionate about doing this when I became director. And with the refunding of CIRM, I actually started to think, is, is that mission, I don't know, is it, is it gone? Was it, was it not gonna be something that made sense for the center to continue? I'm gratified to see so many people here tonight because that tells me um, that this kind of outreach is important. And as I've been reflecting on the last year, as I'm sure many of you have been with coronavirus and where COVID-19 has, has left us, how it's affected all of us, I really have been reflecting about science and communication and, and the role of communicating science in how we got to where we are and how we're gonna get out of it and how important it's going to be going forward for all of us. So by that, I mean, uh, of course, I think we could have had better communication in, in some domains that may have helped us to emerge more quickly from the pandemic, at least to be able to deal with it. But I also think um, in addition to that, there's just some stories that have been missed in terms of whether they've been conveyed um, out into the public and on the media or in, in other forums. Many of you have heard me talk about the importance 
of scientific research, basic research at universities, and how critical this is for the pipeline of generating patents and startup companies, and in fact, leading through to clinical trials that actually make changes for people's lives. And it occurred to me at the end of our vaccine series with our panelists last time that there really was a set of stories that um, have not come out in all of this. And so I thought I would take a moment and use the role of basic science investment and how important that was in COVID-19 vaccine development to just illustrate, to use that as an analogy for why refunding CIRM and what having a new CIRM start in 2021 is going to mean for us in terms of stem cell research and regenerative medicine. Because I think these are some things that probably people don't entirely realize. So the US National Institutes of Health, many of you have heard me talk about that, provides $4 billion a year in funding to immunology and vaccine research groups. This is at the very most basic science level. And this is critically supplemented by philanthropic funds, largely in the case of vaccines for developing countries um, in, in part by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but by other individual donors at universities that really have an impact and make a difference. University laboratories, it is university laboratories working on HIV and influenza vaccines that actually developed the mRNA technology that is used in the Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna NIH vaccines. And this emerged only over the last 10 years because of those basic science investments. This has led to investigations for Zika, for Ebola, for coronavirus, and those vaccine program develop that programs that have been developed at the NIH and in the pharmaceutical industry that allowed us to make the progress that we have over the last year. In fact, the Moderna vaccine was made as a collaboration with the NIH Vaccine Research Center. It's just funded by US taxpayers, US tax dollars since 1997. And the goal of that is simply to create vaccines against viruses and other human diseases. In fact, NIH also funds an extensive network of clinical trial sites for clinical vaccine research. This played a very important role in COVID-19 vaccine testing just like the alpha stem cell clinics that are funded by CIRM play a really critical role in the testing of stem cell therapeutics for and other regenerative medicine strategies as, as well as um, uh, novel approaches to target cancer, for example, CAR T cells, and to modulate um, individual cells with viral mediated technologies. U.S. Taxpayers, taxpayers right now are spending about $18 billion on the production and distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. This is my punchline. And this would not have been possible without consistent earlier funding of basic immunology and vaccinology um, research. And so I thought I would make this point that basic science looks like this. It, it starts here. It is a maze. When we go into it, not only do we not know what's inside it, we have no idea how we're going to navigate around it. We get lost a lot as basic scientists. But mapping it out, that discovery biology, is what lets us lead to technological advances that can have a real impact on human health, like the RNA technology that led to the development of the vaccines for COVID-19. Basic science starts in the maze. Translational science starts here. We already know what's in it. We know what we're trying to get to, and it's the nitpicky details that we're trying to work out in order to actually take those final steps. And that is what we do here at the Stem Cell Center, that full spectrum of research from basic science on through translational and into clinical trials. And so I hope you learned something new about COVID and vaccines, and I hope this gives you some renewed appreciation for how important Prop 14 and restarting CIRM funding this year has been for us. So let me introduce um, without trying to get back to my slides, let me um, actually do two things. Let me highlight for you our upcoming lecture, which is uh, on Tuesday, April 6th. This will be Diane O'Dowd, who's actually the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs here at UCI, former Chair of Developmental and Cell Biology, along with Jack Lynn, um, talking about stem cell insights into epilepsy. Um, that's our next upcoming community lecture. Tonight, however, we have um, a terrific opportunity to hear from two young investigators new to UCI. They are a part of a faculty hires for leveraged research excellence recruitment that we did with the School of Engineering, um, in particular with chemical and biomolecular engineering and Vasa and Vinogopalan there. There are two new hires that are just coming on. We're so excited to have here. Herdeline Ardonia, who received her PhD from John Hopkins and was a postdoctoral fellow 
at Harvard University and Dr. Quentin Smith. He received his PhD also from Johns Hopkins and it was and still is a Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute investigator, Hannah Gray, postdoctoral fellow at MIT, just in the process of moving out to UC Irvine right now. They are gonna tell us tonight about their research that bridges engineering and biomaterials um, with stem cell research. And we're super excited to welcome them to the center and welcome them to our faculty. So please, Herdeline and Quinton, take it away. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anderson, for the kind introduction. And I'm really excited to be a part of this um, community uh, lecture series to really highlight um, some of the research aims that we've been doing for the past couple of years. Uh, so today, um, Dr. Adornia and I would want to, like to talk about how we can actually use stem cells and materials as regenerative medicine. And this research is really based upon a grim statistic. In the United States, over 100,000 people are in need of a life-saving surgery and annually 8,000 people die waiting for a transplant because there's a lack of available organs for donation. Um, so different engineering tools, for example, have allowed us to bridge the gap to transplantation. So you've been able to create, for example, the dialysis machine for the kidney and also um, pumps for the heart. But when it comes to more complex tissues, I would say, such as the liver, which is the largest internal organ within your body, it does over 500 different functions. So we can actually create a device to do all these different things. So tissue engineering has emerged as an interdisciplinary field where we can take engineering, chemistry, mathematics to really create scaffolds, cells, tissues to actually replace or augment that functionality. So like why stem cells pose as a really great potential to really meet this high demand is that if you look at the liver, for example, there are over 200 billion hepatocytes, the main functioning cell type within the liver. But stem cells can actually be derived from adult cells, such as the skin or hair, and we can program them into an embryonic state, and then we can coax them to mature into a healthy cell, and then we can use that as a cellular therapy. So one of the Although stem cells are very exciting and a new um, aspect that we've been really excited for treating diseases, there are a couple of limitations. These limitations include a really a poor insight into the basic developmental events that drive um, the formation of the various tissues within our body. And we have techniques within the lab to actually grow stem cells to different tissues, but they really lack high efficiency and they lack reproducibility. And we actually lack tools to really properly evaluate the function of these cells and how mature these cells are. As a chemical engineer by training, I'm excited to say that we can actually use engineering technologies to recreate the microenvironment in which cells reside to actually coax these pluripotent stem cells to mature cells by using different aspects of engineering tools to mimic things that we see within our body. So as Dr. Smith mentioned, we can certainly interface non-living materials um, with cells and tissues. And depending on how we engineer them and how, or how we design them, these materials will allow us to deliver the necessary cues for the growth of these stem cells or the repair or regeneration of damaged tissues. And in terms of delivering these materials uh, to the body, they can either be implantable, which is a more invasive, uh, which involves an invasive technique, or they can be injectable. Um, and upon delivering them to the body, these materials serve as the local environment of the cells. So meaning that they do not only uh, deliver the cues that are necessary for the growth, but they act as a physical support. Um, so one of the examples for that is, um, for example, if you have a scaffold that has a specific surface topography um, that can provide the alignment to the cells, then the cells will grow as aligned. And this is sometimes and oftentimes important for uh, the function of the tissues that will be grown from those cells. 
Now, when we're talking about local and microenvironment for the cells, it's important to note that this can vary from patient to patient. And that is why there has been a lot of emergent efforts um, towards personalization of regenerative medicine, not only from the standpoint of using patient-derived stem cells, but also, and more importantly, uh, delivering the important microenvironment uh, that these cells need. And one of the ways that we can do that is to appropriately design the biomaterials um, where these stem cells are interfaced with. So some of the example approaches would be using bioscaffolds that can deliver drugs and using patient-specific enzymes to modulate the release of these drugs, or developing adaptable materials that can grow as the patient grows over time, or thinking about using bioactive components that are customizable and delivering this together with the cells and tissues that we use for transplantation. And of course, this involves also developing technologies that will allow us in real time to track the performance of these biomaterials and see if further customization is needed. So for tonight's lecture, we will be discussing about approaches, how we can design biomaterials, and I'll provide a specific example of a biomaterial. And then the second half of the talk will be um, exploring the different properties of certain materials or, or building certain environments and how that can affect stem cell differentiation. So I'll start by sharing my previous research on peptide-based biomaterials. Now, the mo main motivation for using macromolecules that are derived from biological systems is thinking about biocompatibility. So when we want to engineer systems or materials for biological applications, it's, it's very attractive to think about components that are naturally found in our body and using that as building blocks. So for example, thinking about peptides and proteins, which can form uh, ordered structures depending on the environment that they're in. And these are just some example structures that I'm showing in the figure on the left. And what's interesting is when you look at the molecular level, the bonds that are actually holding these structures and uh, that are driving these structures are weak non-covalent bonds, such as hydrogen bonding, um, which means that these bonds are dynamic, so your structures can assemble and reassemble depending on the trigger that we have in the environment. The other interesting factor about peptides is that their assembly can be based on the amino acid sequence that comprise them. So then you can think about a specific peptide sequence that can self-assemble, form fibrils with a specific pitch, with a specific twist, and they form networks uh, upon aggregation that could that then lead to the formation of matrix um, that can support cellular adhesion or cellular growth. Now, specifically for tonight, I'll talk about pi-conjugated peptides. Um, uh, this class of materials are uh, do have peptides on the periphery for each of the individual units, which we can call as monomers. And at the core, it has an electroactive unit, um, so pi systems. Um, and upon assembly or aggregation, because of the presence of these pi electroactive units, uh, pi conjugated electroactive units, um, we can form one-dimensional structures that do have a conduit at the center for the transport of charged species, making these materials uh, optoelectronically active or electronically active. So it's important to also note that the, um, that the assembly of these materials can respond to specific triggers or simple triggers such as pH or the presence of ions in the environment. So shown in the right are actual images of these um, peptides that form one dimensional structures. And because they have electronic uh, properties, you can consider them as analogous, uh, as biological analogs of wires. And at higher con concentrations, they do form hydrogels. Um, and depending on how you form those hydrogels, you can make them aligned, which I mentioned earlier, can be important for certain uh, tissues. 
Now, why do we need to form or create materials that have electronic properties or materials that can be used for bioelectronic applications? One way to think about it is that in the laboratory, when we grow cells that are electrically active, so for example, neurons or cardiomyocytes, they needed to be electrically stimulated. And the way that this is conventionally done is using physical electrodes. So what's shown here is a carbon rod electrode and in fact, uh, the electrical stimulation of stem cell derived cardiomyocytes have been shown to be helpful to drive the maturation of these cells and show more adult like phenotype. So although this way of electrically stimulating cells work, um, you can think of the electrodes as stiff foreign material that is integrating with your biological systems, with your cells and tissues. And thinking about long-term cultures, of course, you wanted electrodes that can more seamlessly integrate with the biological systems or um, decreasing the need for, for the wire connections within, within your models. And there are certainly emerging approaches that allow for seamless integration, but more so on the side of inorganic materials. And remember that our body is comprised of organic materials. And um, among these approaches, um, the electrodes are integrated within the tissues, but also there are other approaches out there that can utilize light uh, to trigger the action potentials or the signals in your electrically active um, cells, such as neurons and cardiomyocytes, as I mentioned. Now, what's the advantage of using organic materials? So organic materials uh, that are electrically active, um, meaning those components that are found in flexible displays or those that are found in wearable sensors and also coupling them with peptides or proteins, as I mentioned earlier. So these types of materials offer more flexibility um, and, and they are soft. So that matches the mechanical property of what's found in the native physiological environment. And also it's much more easier to functionalize, meaning modify the surfaces of these structures and make them more compatible with, with what's required by the cells. Uh, and in certain cases, um, we can find systems that um, can generate currents just based on uh, triggering it or exciting your systems with light and without requiring wired connections. Now, um, as I mentioned, I'll be specifically talking about pi-conjugated systems for today. And this part of this lecture will be focusing on preparing a certain class of biomaterial and showing you how we can systematically tune their design. So for this model molecule that I have right here, we have peptides on both the periphery and then the electroactive unit. I'll refer to it throughout the talk as OT4. This is a known uh, P-type organic semiconductor. And the idea as to how we can investigate um, how to tune the properties based on amino acid sequence is just by simply changing the amino acids that's next to the pi conjugated core and systematically increasing the size and hydrophobicity of those side chains uh, with the hypothesis in mind that this changes the stacking distance or the way that these um, monomers arrange and form those one-dimensional structures. So in the bulk level, we were able to see that even with just these minute changes in the amino acid, we can see significant changes in the stiffness or the uh, mechanical properties of uh, the hydrogels that are formed by these peptides, by conjugated peptides. And also we can see significant changes um, in the resistance or uh, the electrical properties of the films, the dry films that are formed from the assembly of these peptides. Now, these just to show you that all of those peptides that we assessed do form one dimensional structures. And so they do aggregate and, and uh, adhere to the model that I've, I've shown earlier uh, a couple of slides ago. 
Now, with that in mind, we also sought to see how the systematic changes in amino acid sequence can be used to modify the optical properties of our material. So by optical properties, we mean the absorbance, the photoluminescence or fluorescence, and also the circular dichroism, or essentially just the absorbance in response to a polarized light. Now, I will show you a couple of graphs right now just to see that the dashed uh, plots that you have is equivalent to the monomer or representing the optical property of the monomer. And then the different uh, amino acids are shown, the profile for the different amino acid uh, modifications uh, for these pi conjugated peptides are shown here, are represented here. What's interesting is that the smaller amino acids are significantly different than the peptides with the larger amino acids. And we can actually see a trend starting from the absorbance profile. And when we look at the photoluminescence, we can see that uh, the quenching, which represents more aggregation or more close stacking, uh, is more evident with the smaller amino acid. And um, in the circular algorithm, we see this bisignate signal that is more intense only for the smaller amino acid, um, the, the glycine and alanine. And this shows that even in the molecular level packing, which we can probe using the optical properties, we can see these changes and we can tune these properties even though it's the same family of molecules, monomers, but just doing the simple amino acid sequence differentiation. So then the other question that we ask is, can we see a trend in the electrical properties of these pi conjugated peptides when they are assembled? So then we sought with our collaborators and, um, and they helped us build a device uh, called uh, field effect transistors. And using this device, it allowed us to measure a parameter called the whole mobility, which is a metric of the carrier conduction or con of the conduction along the long axis of the assembled peptides that we have. So a schematic of the device is shown on the left. We're in uh, essentially, in this device, we have three electrodes. You have a source and drain electrodes that spanning the semiconductor, and then a gate electrode where it, whereby the gate layer um, helps shape the current flow that's occurring within the device. Now, for this specific device, we used our peptide OT4 nanostructures in the semiconductor layer. And the measurements that we saw is that the, as the adjacent amino acid size uh, increases, we also see a trend in the measured whole mobility and see that uh, those with larger amino acids next to the pi conjugated core have lower mobilities, which is consistent with the hypothesis that uh, these minute changes in the amino acid next to the pi conjugated core definitely changes the stacking distance or at least the stacking order and can affect the properties that I've shown you, which are um, bulk mechanical properties and also the optical and electrical properties. So now that we've learned a little bit about how these, these properties can be tuned for the materials, we, the, there's another uh, bio-inspired approach that I then took with these materials. And that is looking at the um, elect energy transfer that's happening in photosynthetic systems. So in photosynthetic systems, we have protein pigment complexes. So there are multiple pigments that are involved in that process. And what's interesting is that the proteins that are complex with these pigments, they actually assist in the position of those pigments so that the energy transfer can happen in the most efficient manner um, and, and is consistent with the idea of funneling the energy from the highest energy pigment all the way to the reaction center. So now then going back to our biomaterial, the pi conjugated system, 
we then ask whether we can incorporate more than one chromophore, more than one electroactive unit. In this case, we have an energy donor, um, which upon uh, light excitation, uh, the, the energy migrates from the donor to the acceptor. And this is in fact what we saw when we merged them together and uh, in the photoluminescence spectra as shown on the right. So even with just 1% of the acceptor, uh, we can see a decrease in the, um, in the intensity of the photoluminescence that we see in the donor. And as we increase the percentage of the acceptor unit, the, um, uh, the, the spectral profile that we see quenches more and mimics more and more the profile of the acceptor. So what I want you to take away from this graph is that we were able to see these quenching of peaks that represents a successful energy transfer, even under completely aqueous environments, which usually does not happen easily when these electroactive systems are not conjugated with peptides. Now, as a control, we looked at just assembling individually uh, the donor stacks and as acceptor stacks, and we can see that the quenching is not as efficient. So absolutely, th this tells us that we've been successful in combining the donor and acceptor units in one biological wire, um, and we were able to see and control the energy transport processes that are happening within our bio-inspired peptide-based um, nanostructures. So then the last thing that I want to show about these interesting structures is that we further extended and, and have a, and, and developed a system with two components, but this time three chromophores in the assembly. So now here, other than um, incorporating the three chromophores, we also looked at whether we can modulate the rate of the pH drop so that we can control the type of assembly that we see in the nanostructures or the distribution of the the types of distribution that we see of the acceptor within the donor moiety, whether it is self-sorted or co-assembled. And again, when we look at the spectroscopic profile, what I want you to take away from these graphs is that the different types of assembly, whether it's self-sorted or co-assemble, absolutely shows different types of energy transport as represented by these photoluminescence uh, spectral profile. So we controlled the rate of the assembly by, um, by varying the trigger that we used. So we can achieve self-sorted structures by slowly assembling them over 20 hours. And then we have um, one that is more fast and leads to the co-assembly of the different chromophores that we have. Um, and what's interesting is that even we age these co-assembled systems, um, they still do not reorganize into the self-sorted systems, meaning that through variations in the trigger method, we can control the structure. And by controlling the structure, we could then control the energy transfer processes that are happening in these um, nanomaterials. So moving forward, um, my group is currently developing the next generation of these bio-inspired peptide materials with optical and electronic functionalities. And we do want to drive the applications of these materials towards either controlling cells, uh, applying them for um, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, for example, or using them for probing or sensing applications. And before I end this part, I just wanna highlight that as we think about the design and, and modulate the properties of these systems and bring it closer to the bio-interfacing, we always go back to the design aspect and keep the lessons learned so that we can incorporate and modulate the properties of our materials depending on the local environment, microenvironment, where we will be applying these systems, which as I mentioned in the beginning, is important for customization of the types of materials that we use for different biological applications.
And so with that, uh, we'll move forward to the next part of this lecture where we will hear more from uh, Professor Smith about his work on uh, different using different engineering strategies for um, directing stem cell differentiation. So thank you so much, Dr. Donya. Really fascinating research. Um, so I'm going to talk about and shift gears a little bit about how we can use engineering tools to control the stem cell microenvironment. So here are pictures. If you could go back one slide. Here are pictures of stem cells grown on different shaped micro patterns. And I want to tell you a story about how we got to this using different engineering tools. As a primer, I want to demonstrate that our cells can self-organize during development. So a very early structure during human development is something called, uh, it goes through a process called gastrulation. So all of our tissues um, actually come from three different germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And today I wanna to talk to you about the mesoderm, which gives rise to all the cardiovascular lineages. So we talked about the beating cells such as the cardiomyocytes that make up the heart. And I wanna talk about the vasculature, which is really important for the tissue engineering purposes because they're really important in transporting oxygen, nutrients, and waste for your tissues. But before these cells can actually become these cardiovascular lineages, they first have to go through a milestone. So they're actually kind of in like the puberty stage where they express a marker called brachyry. So before they, be, before they can become these mature cells, they have to express something called brachyry. So these brachyry precursors actually form something called the vascular plexus. So it's really fascinating. So during development, one of the first things to actually develop is your blood vessels. So this actually happens before the heart begins to pump. So once you have the blood vessels formed in a process called vasculogenesis, they begin to mature in a process called angiogenesis. So you have sprouts, blood vessel sprouts from this pre-existing template. So the, the blood vessels are arranged by size. So you have large arteries and veins. And in smaller sections, these um, vessels are called capillaries. And these cells are supported um, by stromal cells called small muscle cells or pericytes. And cells that line your blood vessels are called endothelial cells. So as an engineer, we can look at different ways that we can actually study the vasculature. So you can think about it. So in your arteries, you have oxygenated blood and your veins, you have deoxygenated blood. So as engineers, we can control these parameters to study the vasculature system. You can imagine if you have a diseased blood vessel in a case such as atherosclerosis, your vessels actually get harder. So we can use some of these material approaches to grow these cells in hard environments to really study that disease. So how do we create blood vessels from scratch. I, I love saying it that way because we can actually take stem cells and direct them to virtually any cell type in the body. And there are many different approaches. Very early on, people used a technique called embryo body formation. We can actually take colonies of stem cells and allow them to just randomly differentiate and mature. But I used a directed differentiation method. So basically what we're able to do is we're able to introduce a chemical cocktail to encourage these stem cells to undergo this vascular specification. And in this case, it took 12 days where we could get endothelial cells, those cells that line the blood vessels, and these stromal cells that support the vessels. So we can start from these large circular colonies of pluripotent stem cells, and we can push them to this early vascular fate. And we can see through these um, immunofluorescent images where we can stain particular proteins, that represent the different vascular uh, tissues, we can see we get these beautiful red endothelial cells and we get these green stromal supporting cells. So this evening, I wanna talk to you about how we can use engineering technologies to demystify the process in which these stem cells mature and how we can use these engineering technologies to also control the architecture of tissues to mimic those in the body and how we can introduce physiologically relevant forces to study cells in their native environment. So you can wonder, like, how do you actually do that? So as an engineer, we can actually pull motivation from different disciplines. So we can actually look at the computer manufacturing industry. So this is a picture of one of the early integrated circuits in 1964. 
So here you can actually put about five transistors in that small device. And from that technology, we actually had this IBM 360, which is this large computer but out, that actually was used to help send Neil Armstrong to the moon. Today, we can actually use a process called photolithography to literally um, write or etch features that basically run your computers. So we have this manufacturing technology that's described by something called the Moore's Law, where we can create more and more integrated circuits at a smaller scale. So if you can pick, compare the computer in 1964, it had about 664 transistors. In a typical iPhone today, it has over 11.8 billion transistors. So you can actually think the device in your pocket has more computing power than the instruments that were used to sell Neil Armstrong to the moon. So we can actually use those miniaturization technologies towards medical applications. So we can actually pattern different features to study how stem cells lose their pluripotency over time. So we can create micro patterns, for example, in this case, that range from 80 to 500 microns in diameter. So to put that in context, your human hair is about 100 microns in width. So you can create features on that length scale. So we can take stem cells that have a uniform marker expression, and then we can place them on these different micro pattern domains. So initially, these stem cells will be fluorescent for this marker, TRA181, which is shown in green. And we can put these stem cell populations on varying microenvironments in a high throughput manner. And we can look at the loss of pluripotency or the loss of green on these miniature um, environments that mimic development. So with that ability, we can create hundreds of different microenvironments. We can actually use image processing as a way to quickly interrogate how these miniature communities impact stem cell fate. So for example, we can take an original image and use a computer algorithm to identify individual pattern features. And we can be begin to do quantitation on those parameters. So we can count the number of stem cells that are present on these micro patterns. And we can calculate the number of cells that express this pluripotent marker. And we can begin to acquire a lot of different statistics about this process. So in addition to losing pluripotency, we can look at how they mature. So here's a movie that I think is really fascinating. We can actually plate stem cells on these pattern surfaces using this miniaturization technology from the computer industry to look at how stem cells survey their microenvironment. And within this study, we looked at early vascular precursors. So I remember I talked about that T or brachyry, and we actually see that it's enriched at the periphery of these micropattern domains. And what's really interesting, if we look at our control case, where we have cells that are grown on circular micro patterns, we see this annulus of early mesoderm cells that will give rise to vascular tissue. However, if you use a drug that inhibits the, the ability for cells to sense their microenvironment, they no longer have this ability to form this self-organized -organiz tissue. And we can do this for many different shapes and many different sizes. So this is our control case, where we can see this really um, reproducible organization of early progenitor cells from stem cells. And we can do the same thing within our um, drug treated samples in which the stem cells lose this mechanosensing ability. So coupled with image processing, we can use all that information to actually predict how the cells will react based on these micro pattern domains. And importantly, Remember that green annulus of brachyry positive cells that give rise to vascular cells? We can see if we continue to differentiate the stem cells on these micro patterns, we can see an enrichment of red endothelial cells at the edges of those micro pattern domains. However, if we use a drug to inhibit the tension that the cells have, they are not able to undergo this vascular um, program, meaning that very important cues during development dictate how stem cells mature. Next, I wanna talk about how we can use this uh, photo patterning technology to create microfluidic devices. So here's an example of a microfluidic device that's 250 microns wide. So this is a little bit larger than a width of a human hair. And we can actually seed 
stem cell derived endothelial cells within these microfluidic devices. And we can actually see this video going inside the channel and we can actually flow blood-like substances throughout these channels to create an environment that your cells would normally experience during development. So as a graduate student, you know, I started my undergrad in chemical engineering. I didn't have a lot of um, uh, biology. So when I went to graduate school, I took an advanced cell bio course and I became fascinated by something called primary cilia. And these are little hair-like antenna protrusions that stick out on virtually every single cell. And they've been implicated in the ability for cells to sense their microenvironment. So um, in this movie here, a lot of groups have actually used zebrafish to look at early vascular development. So here we can actually see in real time the development of the blood vasculature. And we see that the vasculature within the zebrafish actually have these little hair-like cilia projections that we presume to actually be the sensor where they can feel the heartbeat and blood flowing through those vessels. Fascinating, we can actually see that these cilia protrusions actually bend and deflect in response to the viscous forces from the blood. One of the main um, reactions of this deflection of the cilia shown in green is an uptake of an electrolyte called calcium. So you can actually find it in Gatorade, but this is actually a fuel that helps a lot of different signaling mechanisms within your body. And what was found in this work is if you actually lose the ability for these cilia to actually sense the blood flow, you actually have a reduction in vascular maturation. But this is in zebrafish. So we wanted to see, can we use our stem cells to mimic human development? So here's an image of endothelial cells from a diseased stem cell, where we actually can't see any of these hair-like cilia projections. But if we look at other stem cell sources that are healthy, which is a great power of the stem cell technology, we actually see in red these hair-like protrusions. So when we use these cells in our microfluidic devices, we actually see that the non-ciliated BC1 cells shown on the top row actually can't elongate and align to the direction of flow, which is a hallmark marker of endothelial cell functionality. However, endothelial cells that are equipped with these cilia projections are able to elongate and respond to these forces. And we were only able to study this phenomena using these engineering tools. We can also use these technologies to look at that calcium influx in response to these, the, the fluid forces. And we see in our disease stem cell that they have aberrant uptake of calcium. However, our healthy stem cell-derived endothelial cells can appropriately respond to the physical forces that we administer to them. So in addition to adding physiologically relevant fluid forces, we can actually control the architecture of tissues. So during my postdoc work, I was really interested and focused on the liver. So I mentioned there are over 200 billion hepatocytes, which are the main workhorse within the liver. But there's also a vessel-like architecture like the blood vessels called the bile duct that's responsible for carrying out toxic bile acid that your hepatocytes secrete to the small intestines where it aids in digestion. If you actually don't have this proper architecture of the biliary ducts, you can actually have the bile outflow and this could be manifested as something called jaundice where you actually have yellowing in the eyes. So using a different approach or a different engineering technology we can fabricate structures that mimic the native architecture within the liver. So we actually use something um, similar to our photolithography technique, but now we can introduce acupuncture needles. Yes, acupuncture needles. And we can actually use natural biomaterials as a scaffold. So we can use these needles as a sacrificial mold and we can cast collagen over these needles. And once we remove the needles, we can have on-demand perfusible structures that look like the native bile duct. And here's an image that we can have of these 300 micron um, diameter tubes that mimic the native biliary tissue within our bodies. So I hope I was able to convince that we can use pluripotent stem cells as a, as a model of human development 
And my lab is really focused on combining stem cell derivatives that make up the vasculature, um, the liver cells, and we can combine them for regenerative medicine applications. Yeah, and just before we end this talk for today, just want to highlight that we continue to use these engineering concepts either to mimic the microenvironment or directly um, directly engineer materials to be interfaced with, with, with the cells or tissues um, so that we can continue to customize the needs of these cells and, and um, go beyond the one size fits all idea for, for developing materials to be used for stem cells. And in that way, we can advance further advance stem cell technologies. And with that, we thank everyone for joining us tonight and, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. So Quinton, if you could go ahead and start your video also. Um, I think the, uh, the way, actually, I don't think the way it works is that we'll have questions come in um, through the audience uh, from either Facebook Live or through the q and I'll be monitoring those. Um, we do have a couple that are, that are appearing. Um, Herline, if you could stop your screen share, at least since yours is working, that's great, perfect. And um, Quentin, there you are, that's awesome. So I'll feed questions to you out of the Q&A and you guys reply as you see fit. So we have one for Quentin. Um, could you specify how the chemical cocktail actually works on the stem cell colonies? Oh, that is a very good question. So there are many different growth factors, inflammatory signals, what we actually get that actually flow in the blood. So these are all factors that are motivated by studies in mouse development, for example. So we can actually use something called recombinant growth factors, so human growth factors. And we actually just add it as like a soup. So in the media to where the cells are. And cells are equipped with receptors on their surface. And basically, this, the cocktail contains ligands to these receptors. And basically, they engage and the cells internalize these factors, and it basically drives their downstream events. But one important thing towards the differentiation is that the timing of when you add those factors are critical to how they mature. So during development, if you add the factors too late, the cells are not competent or can't respond to those cues. It's perfect. Um, can I do just a follow up there? Because I think one thing you make such a compelling argument in terms of the need for organ transplantation, particularly for liver, right? It's such a complex organ. So spin this out for us all the way to the end, right? So at the end of the day, if your wildest dreams come true, you're super successful in terms of patterning and vascularization and all of these complex problems for cell specification that need to be solved. What do you envision? Are you going to regrow an organ that gets transplanted? Are you going to make an organ that's on a chip that resides outside the body and performs these multiple functions? Is that going to be a stage thing? If you, if you will look into the future 10 years from now, wh where will this technology be? So that's actually a really good question. So as you may or may not know, the liver actually has a native ability to regenerate. But after, after repeated injury, it actually loses that regenerative capacity. So really the focus of my work is to be able to take a patient's healthy cells, reprogram them into an embryonic state, and push them towards those liver lineages. And then we actually can use different engineering technologies, such as 3D printing, to begin to assemble the tissue. So we can assemble the vasculature, we can use ways to pattern them in particular conduits, we can incorporate the hepatocytes that do the over 500 different functions such as detoxifying drugs. And then we can, then we can create grafts. We can actually implant them ectopically, so not directly where the liver is. And basically these, these livers can actually process um, different um, drugs, for example, within the body. And they act as like a secondary site that maintains the function um, of a normal liver. So the idea is that we can actually create off-the-shelf cellular therapies for people that have these diseases. Great answer. That's that's perfect. So then I'm going to ask a parallel question. We do have a, a couple of more that have come in, but um, for Herdeline, if you think the same thing, right? How will you um, 
how do you see in your wildest dreams the kinds of biomaterial development that you're doing now, combining with cell or regenerative therapies to move forward into a, a next stage from a, a practical application point of view that's going to alter, you know, and impact people's lives. Yeah, so I think there are different directions that we are looking at for these types of materials. So one thing that I have mentioned is utilizing uh, the sensing capability. So thinking about devices where these materials can deliver the cues, but at the same time can be used to record the signals from electro uh, electrically active cells. And then another application to think about is just from the standpoint of developing bioscaffolds. Since we are using peptides, uh, which are, as I mentioned in my presentation, natural bu building blocks that you can find in your body. And um, we can create scaffolds that can degrade uh, over time, uh, that, that we can um, that we can engineer the degradation uh, based on the regrowth that we are seeing in the tissues. And then lastly, I wanna emphasize that these materials can also be used to create model tissues. So closer to the chip-based technology that I think uh, Quentin have mentioned in, in his uh, presentation, in his part of his presentation. So I wanna emphasize that developing model tissues or model organs um, that can be enabled by these types of materials are important in terms of thinking about high throughput screening for developing models that can be done in the laboratory for understanding mechanisms of diseases. Um, so those are the different directions that we can look at in terms of uh, applying the materials that I have developed and but as I have shown in my presentation, I am both interested in the application, but also doing the basic science for these types of materials is important for enabling the types of applications that we can see uh, in the future. I certainly couldn't agree any more with that. It's the full pipeline that's that's really critical. We do have a follow-up question um, for you, Herdeline, which is, do you see applications? So understanding the importance of basic biology, do you see applications of your peptide conductive polymers for uh, temporary or even permanent nerve repair, right? As one thing that could be possible down the line, either presumably in the case of peripheral nerve injury or potentially, in the case of a, a central injury like a spinal cord injury? Yeah, in fact, we have tried using an analog of these peptide assemblies for human neural stem cells. And, um, and we've shown that they are biocompatible and by in incorporating certain peptide epitopes that are relevant for, I think more relevant for the peripheral nerve injuries rather uh, as compared to spinal cord injury, um, that axonal regrowth can, can be facilitated in, in these hydrogels. So in terms of answering whether temporary or uh, permanent. I think we need to do further studies uh, with regards to st stability of the hydrogels in physiological environments. The the um, the study that I have described is in vitro, and we haven't really tried in vivo studies for these types of materials. So, my my. Um, my short answer is, yes, we are looking into these types of applications, whether it's temporary or permanent, we need to do further studies. That's great. Um, and thanks for your answer. Quentin, um, if I could pester you with a, another question that we have, a little bit off topic for you from the context of organ regeneration, but the question is whether you have um, any, any information or research from your line of work that is related to muscle tissues and muscle stem cells. Oh, that is a really good question. <laughs> so I particularly good. haven't studied uh, muscle stem cells um, in my research, but I do know of a lot of groups that um, do both pluripotent stem cell derived and mesenchymal stem cells as for muscle regeneration, for example. So I know there are a lot of different applications in cellular populations that can be used particularly for those different diseases and applications for sure. Yeah. 
And so I will just highlight there, another of our new faculty recruits is Dr. Michael Hicks, yeah. who is located in the Stem Cell Research Center. And he studies muscle regeneration is really central part of what his work is. And I don't have it in front of me since my slides have crashed for the evening and I can't get them back. But um, he will be speaking within the next couple of weeks coming up. And so I think everyone should have access to our upcoming schedule. And that would be something to keep an eye on in terms of um, future presentations. And let me just see for a second here. Um, I'm going to, I guess so this is a, a hair to line sort of question. How do you foresee the use of injectable thermosensitive hydrogels being compatible with live cellular components? And I think there are a number of ways that that, that works, but um, if you could feel that one, that would be great. Yeah, I think there are a couple of um thermosensitive polymers that have been used at least in vivo. Um, so um, for example, polynipam is one example of that hydrogel and it's used not only in solitary, but there are composite uh, systems that um, have, for example, hydrogels that have used polynipam plus another component that takes care of the um, other cues, uh, since we are talking about uh, delivering cues to the cells at the beginning of the talk. Um, yeah, so thinking about biocompatibility of these systems, there, there are both in vitro and in vivo studies that have already shown, uh, but I think I would also add to my answer that it depends also on the type of cells that you are using these for. Um, yeah, so uh, there, what I can say is there's certainly certainly literature that have used thermosensitive polymers and primarily you, you'll mainly see polynipam for, for those types of um, studies. Yep, and just for a like a practical indication side of things, for example, this has been tested with neural stem cells and spinal cord injury, where you um, make compatible biopolymers, you seed those ahead of time, um, you know, obviously, uh, uh, so that the cells aren't damaged, and then they um, solidify after injection. And that can be really important if you're trying to go into something like a contusion space, which is basically a cavity within the central nervous system to fill it up and provide some opportunity um, for repair. Um, how about this? Is, uh, is there a, a path towards sort of, and I'll toss this out to the two of you, pers personalized biomaterials or, or person personalized lab on a chip, you know, combinations down, down the path um, that is practical, right? From a cost effectiveness point of view, how do you think that will work out? Is it viable to think about bringing some of these forward in a personalized medicine sense? Because that's a, a huge impact, both for stem cell biology and the potential of induced pluripotent cells, um, and um, because of the, you know, the need to be able to pre pre prevent rejection um, in terms of cellular therapeutics. So, does that become, you know, a viable opportunity to think about in the in that five year or ten year time frame? I'm mixing a couple of questions <laughs> together for you guys. Well, I definitely think that, you know, in my research, I think I highlighted natural biomaterial scaffolds. Typically, we use, for example, isolates from rat. We use rat tail collagen. But one way we can actually achieve personalized biomaterials is with the advent of synthetic materials. So we can actually use very cheap polymers, such as PEG. This is actually used in like lotions, for example. And you can actually tune the properties of these polymers to have particular stiffnesses. You can functionalize these materials to have specific binding motifs for which this, the cells that you want to incorporate. So at that point of view, you can actually manufacture these personalized uh, materials in a high throughput manner, as opposed to using like a natural scaffold that requires this isolation. So I think there's definitely a lot of room for um, using these personalized biomaterials. And then when you think of it from an FDA regulation standpoint, you want something that is reproducible. Anything that's naturally derived has batch to batch variability. So definitely with the advent of material science, we can actually build these personalized materials. Yeah, and I will just add into what Quentin has mentioned since you mentioned manufacturing. I think that both the natural derived and for synthetic polymers, there are different studies out there that support the scaling up of both types of materials. So from 
we know that there are lots of studies supporting how we can tune the properties and, and this in a way supports how we can customize and personalize the biomaterials depending on the microenvironment. And then from the scaling standpoint, there are a lot of different um, uh, platforms that can be used either for natural, naturally derived or synthetic polymers. So I do agree with what Quentin has said that there is indeed a pathway to make this, um, this effort towards uh, personalized regenerative medicine viable. Thank you guys both for your answers. I think there's there's one last question that's come in. So I'll um, toss this out as the ending one. I know it's getting a little bit late in terms of time and participation. And, um, and so I wanna thank everyone again for their attendance this evening. Um, the last question we have on the table is, uh, and I, I think it pertains to both of you, is whether there are any avenues in, in these fields where artificial intelligence, where machine learning, where sort of complex um, design parameters parameters can be employed in order to, to help stimulate the research or drive it forward. I, I'll speak about the peptide-based materials that I have uh, mentioned. So in fact, a lot of people that work on self-assembling peptides, not just the electronically active ones, have used machine learning in order to predict the right amino acid sequences that can lead to the perfect assembly, thinking about how they form the, the order. Um, so definitely uh, there are papers that have already supported this, at least from the concrete example that I showed uh, from, from the peptide biomaterials. I personally have not used machine learning to predict the sequences, but I think, um, with the right team and, and finding uh, the right collaborator, I think we, we should be able to do this uh, for our electroactive peptides as well. Yeah, I think that's a very good question and very futuristic in its outlook. I would say from a stem cell perspective, it's very important to incorporate these tools to actually combat one of the, the problems in terms of differentiation efficiency and reproducibility. So actually in some of my work, when we were culturing stem cells on these controlled micro patterns, we used image processing coupled with machine learning as a way to predict from the images if this particular stem cell colony in this arrangement would go down a particular lineage. And this allows us to actually take a step back and have more defined experiments. Because if you actually think about when I talked earlier about the cocktail of factors that we use to induce the maturation of cells, it typically takes a graduate student, <laughs> I did this myself, where you, it's a lot of trial and error. So if you can begin to build pred predictive tools to allow you to have better differentiation efficiency, that's really powerful. And another standpoint that people have used, for example, in the liver space, um, one of the, the bigger downfalls of stem cell derived hepatocytes is their lack of functionality. So people have actually done um, large throughput, small molecule screens to see what molecules actually get these cells to be mature. And with machine learning, you can actually begin to understand what properties of the small molecules induce um, the mature phenotype. So definitely we can begin to design molecules uh, based upon these predictive algorithms to basically let ourselves or let our lives be a little bit easier and more defined. <laughs> and to dissect those pathways, right? So um, I think we'll close it there. Thanks again to everyone who joined us. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Odonia for your um, lectures this evening. And we look forward to seeing everyone um, in a couple of weeks. So good night.